go next. Awesome. It looks like we are We're live. Yeah, it looks like we are live. Okay. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Lupus LA Facebook Live. And today we're going to be talking about holiday stress. Just a little bit of an introduction. My name is Dr. Monica Blyde. I'm a clinical psychologist in Southern California, and I've been living with lupus for the past 10 years, believe it or not, since 2012. I also live with chronic um, migraines and fibromyalgia because of course, when the universe gives you a chronic illness, you can't have just one, it's like Pringles. So let's talk about um, stress management in general and then the particular part, uh, types of stress that come around the holiday season. So as I'm going along, I will be answering questions. So if you have any, just go ahead and type it into the chat. Um, and if you have some later, um, after this live recording, then I'm happy to answer them. Um, and you can just send me an email at drblyde at drblyde.com. You can also get in touch with me um, on all socials, including YouTube at Dr. Blythe. Okay, so why is the holiday, like the holiday season? So that's typically from like end of October through New Year's. Why is that such a stressful time for people? I'm just gonna let you simmer on it. What are some things that came up immediately in your mind? For most people, it's like, because I got to deal with my family, right? Um, just being honest, um, that can be a major stressor. We're also a little bit upended from our typical day-to-day -day routines. So um, your routine may be getting the kids to school, um, coming home, you know, preparing meals or whatever you're doing and then picking them up or your routine may be going to work every day or maybe going to many appointments, be it physical therapy and then occupational therapy and then your mental health therapist. But whatever the case might be, when it comes to the holiday season, all of a sudden, daycares are shut down, schools are shut down, uh, your work is uh, sometimes shut down because you have some holiday time. And then um, you are forced to, you get the opportunity to spend time with family and relatives. And if you haven't had um, regular constant contact, like some people have who live in a community um, where maybe there are multiple generations in a household, um, you are going to your in-law's house and who knows what that relationship might be like and et cetera, et cetera. So not to belabor that point, but for a lot of people, it can be quite stressful. Visiting relatives, new, um, you know, in interrupted routines and uh, schedules. And this is typically the time of year when it starts to get dark earlier. Um, today, um, on the, the West Coast, anyway, I'm in Southern California, the sun is setting at 5.55 p.m. That is very early. And some people also experience something that is abbreviated as SAD, S-A-D, Seasonal Affective Disorder, when there is less sun every day, especially if you do live in places like the Northeast or Minnesota or, you know, those places where it's a lot colder and it gets dark earlier, it can definitely affect your mood, bringing on more depression symptoms and so many other things. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about some strategies for being able to manage these things. I'll go in the same order as I described the problems. So first with <laughs> dealing with family. Then second with upending your routine and then third with the seasonal affective disorder or when you need to reach out for more help. Dealing with family or relatives. One is, one um, opportunity is to, to how you view something, the way that you think about it is going to impact your experience. And so if you go in with the thought of, <sighs> and whatever words come after that huge sigh, then that's going to impact how you experience it, you know, how 
quickly you get irritated or set off by someone's snide comments or rude remarks um, versus if you go in perhaps still keeping your expectations low but with some optimism then your brain will look for other things that are going right instead of what we more naturally do is looking for evidence of things going wrong and that it is bad. So the number one tip is to shift how you're looking at this situation of spending time with family from something that you have to begrudgingly do like, oh, I got to deal with my mama law again, to an opportunity to invest in a relationship and an opportunity to, you know, nurture something or maybe have this greatest possibility that things would be great this time or at least neutral, okay? And again, the reason for that is when we go in with a little bit of optimism, our brain will try to look for what's going right right now. Like, oh my gosh, my, you know, um, my mother-in-law or my, my father or whatever actually waited a whole four minutes before they criticized my weight. Okay, that's an improvement. Normally it's, you know, before I even take my shoes off coming in, you know, again, so just looking for what could go right. Another thing is having boundaries. Boundaries are important just because the expectation is that you go and you spend, you know, the week of Thanksgiving with your family or, you know, the week um, leading up to Hanukkah and those sorts of things with your um, family doesn't mean that it necessarily has to be always in constant contact type of time. So you can create boundaries around like, okay, I'm going to ahead of time, we're going to have these meals together in these times where um, we will be spending special time together. And I'm going to have this time set aside with just me and my nuclear family. Or, and I'm going to have this time where, you know, um, I already have this scheduled, or this is like my nap time. If you guys are living with lupus, living with um, any chronic illness, use it for your advantage, okay? You know, and I don't say this facetiously, but like we need naps. So go ahead and take those naps um, and have that those boundaries around your time and your peace so that you can kind of break away if there is some negativity and toxicity that just draws away your energy that depletes you. Another thing is to create a buffer zone. Okay, so number three, create a buffer zone. If you know that you're going to have to spend, you know, X amount of time with a relative that it's an unpleasant experience, meaning they're, you know, critical, you know, a non-abusive type thing, because in those cases, you just like, you don't, you say no, right? Um, but if it's, you know, they're, you know, they have their own issues and those sorts of things, then create a buffer zone, meaning before you go, you do something that you enjoy, something that brings you pleasure, something that brings you uh, a smile to your face or makes you laugh, hee hee ha ha, spend some time with someone who nourishes you and pours into you before you go to this atmosphere that's going to draw out your energy. So that's before and afterwards already have something planned. So already planned, like, oh, actually my massage is already planned or my, you know, dinner by myself at this, you know, place is already planned before and after the events, you buffer yourself with things that you enjoy just to be able to refill your cup, refill your vessel. Um, the best thing is just to be like, oh, sorry, I can't make it. <laughs> And then just completely protect your peace. But I do understand that sometimes that is not possible. So in those cases, these are some suggestions, some strategies that you can use. There was someone who posted, um, a therapist actually, who posted on Instagram yesterday. I'm looking at my phone. And they had some really great um, tips for how to set boundaries with family around the holiday. So things are, these are some things that you can say. I'll stop by for an hour. I look forward to seeing you. What was that? 
that was setting parameters around how much time you're going to spend there and setting the expectation. Now, if you get there and you're having a great time, he, he, ha, ha, then go ahead and spend longer time, okay? But if you're not, you already let them know like an hour and I'm out, right? Um, another thing is my budget this year won't allow me to travel. I'd love to set up a Zoom date. Um, that's hard when your family lives like in the same area. <laughs> Can't really do that. Like, oh, sorry, I don't got gas money. They're like, we'll come to you. Um, what else? Um, I'm not comfortable being around this person. If they're coming, I won't make it. Thanks for understanding. Now, this is important when you have families where there is toxic behavior happening, where children are unsafe or anything like that, you have to set the strong line in the sand of, no, this is not what I'll tolerate. And just because it's Christmas, just because it's Hanukkah, just because it's Thanksgiving, just because it's whatever um, celebration, I'm not going to make an exception because my safety and my children's safety, whether it be, you know, mental, emotional, physical, sexual safety is a priority. And your feelings, this low of a priority for me compared to our safety and protection. So that's just that. Okay, I'm not willing to discuss X, Y, Z. I'm not willing to discuss my weight, my lifestyle, my identity, my politics, um, my marital status, my when am I going to have babies or whatever the case might be. S establish that boundary ahead of time to make for a more peaceful family environment once you get there. So there are some other um, recommendations that were provided, and I can share that with Lupus LA to share with you all as well. But let's talk about this, the second part, the upending of your routine. One thing that is really helpful for the stress that that causes is to still have elements of your routine, still have elements of the structure in your life that is maintained, even though it's the holiday season. So if you get up every day and you have a spiritual practice, then continue doing that even though you have time away from work or your kids are at home, okay? Or if you get up every day and you have a physical movement or exercise routine, continue to do that. Maintain some semblance of normality, um, some um, continuing your routine, and that's going to help so much with your mental health, okay? And then also you can just write down, write down um, list of what you need to do, of what's not being done because there is this break and difference in schedule and then you can just check it off. And the important thing about actually writing things down is that when you write it, and it could be like physically with a pen or pencil or just typing it into the note section of your phone, but your eyes see that it's down and our eyes are physically connected to our brains, our occipital lobe and um, very other important parts of our brain. Excuse me, my word finding difficulties right now. But the, the point is that when you're I see and your brain receives that this is written down somewhere, your brain can kind of ease up and let it go of, okay, I don't have to hold on to this right now. I don't need to let it kind of spiral around because it's in a place, it's in this contained place. So this can go with your to-do list. This can go with your worries as as far as like, well, what if this happens or what about that? Um, this can even go for the um, grief that a lot of people feel around the holidays if uh, a loved one is not there to celebrate or it's an anniversary of something and you're not celebrating with the people that you, um, you really truly miss. Writing those things down can signal to your brain like, okay, it's okay. There's a place for this and I don't have to just let it linger so much. 
Another thing kind of going along with that and then moving into the sad, the seasonal affective disorder, is allowing yourself to feel your feelings. You may feel frustrated or, you know, and I said that with a smile because it's like, it's almost like the opposite reaction of what's really going on of this, you know, this, this anger and this irritation or just annoyance at everything that's going on. You may feel um, heartbroken. You may feel lonely right now when you compare um, what you have to what others have, you know, not having a whole family or having a whole family as far as people, relatives that are getting together, but it's all very unhealthy. So there could be some isolation that comes up. There can be um, some despair, some grief, so, so many other things. And, and what I recommend is that you let yourself experience all that, let yourself feel those feelings and identify them for what they are. Because sometimes these feelings can come up within our bodies and we just feel this disease, dis-ease, okay? And that can actually aggravate our diseases. Um, we can feel like, I don't know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm vexed. I, you know, my stomach is hurting. I'm getting more headaches every day. My muscles hurt, like what it shows up in our body what we're holding on to or what we're not allowing ourselves to feel. Everything that we're repressing, it shows up one way or another. So if you can instead say like, I feel this unease right now. I feel, you know, tighter. I, I haven't had much of an appetite. Identify what it is. It's called name it. Name it, tame it, reframe it. Okay, so the first naming it is identifying, labeling your emotions, taming it, is kind of allowing your nervous system to calm down where you're not overtaken by your emotions. So you allow yourself to cry because crying is actually something that helps to relax your nervous system. As you cry, manganese is released and it re relaxes the nervous system. It also signals that there's something wrong you need more attention, you need more just time to decompress, okay? So taming it is also saying like, okay, well, um, what else can I do in this moment where I feel less overwhelmed? That could be putting your mind on something else. That could be looking around and being here, present in this day. Because typically what happens in our minds is, you know, if we want to think about these bubbles of thought in our mind, our mind will be so focused on the past bubble and our regrets and what we should have done and could have done and, you know, all these things. And that bubble of the past is a picture of depression. Or our minds might be so far focused in the future about like, well, what is this? event gonna look like? What is this family get together? Or what is me being alone this holiday season going to look like? And, and what about this? And what about that? And that circle, that thought bubble is a picture of anxiety. Most oftentimes we're so stuck in the, the future or perseverating on the past that we miss what's happening right here and right now. So what I'd like you to do as an activity is to pick up a paper and it doesn't have to be like a big paper. I just have like this little notebook paper and at the bottom of that paper, turn it horizontally. And at the bottom of that paper, just like the last one inch, okay? Just draw a line across the last one inch of that paper. And within that line, I want you to write down all your worries, your sadness, your frustration, your isolation, whatever, all the feelings that you have going on. I feel frustrated that X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. I'm worried about how this interaction is going to go. I have just write all that down right here all your to-do lists, like, oh my gosh, I still haven't gone shopping for, you know, this meal, or I still need to put in my honey bake ham order, whatever. Write that all down. 
Give yourself about three or four minutes to write that down. Okay. So we're, we're acknowledging what's in that past bubble, which is that picture of depression symptoms, what's in that future bubble, which is that picture of anxiety symptoms, and we're writing it down. Because again, when we write it down, eyes connected to the brain, our brain is able to see that it's in a place and contained, and I can let it go and not go on these spirals. Then what are you doing with the rest of the page? Up here, what I want you to do is draw what it is today that you're going to focus on. Choose one or two things. Okay, today I'm going to go and get some Starbucks after work. I'm going to go for a walk, you know, after, you know, right before sunset when the UV index is at a zero or a one. I'm going to call and you know check up on my friend or send a text or whatever i'm going to scroll through social media i'm going to you know watch the nature channel and really enjoy learning about fireflies the male fireflies that coordinate their light beeps in order to you know mate or whatever just something and what that's going to do as you're drawing it it's going to refocus your attention i just drew a little person I guess I should draw her with a face. Refocus your attention on the right here and right now, that presence bubble. What is today? Something that is within my control and something that brings me joy or pleasure or maybe something that's just neutral so that we give space and acknowledgement for what else is on our minds, but we don't allow that to be the big headline. It's just a little ticker tape around, along the bottom. And the bigger part of the screen, what the majority of our head space and thought space is, is what is here in front of me right now that I can control that is pleasant or positive or neutral, okay? Name it, tame it. Third thing is reframe it. What is a different way that I can look at this? What is a, What can I tell myself differently about this situation? I talked to you guys about this at the very beginning when I said like, instead of going into the holiday season, like here we go again, you can see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to uh, show up differently where you are maintaining your boundaries and requiring that other people respect it, be it hurt their feelings or not, people are not going to like when you maintain their boundaries because they want you to stay within the roles that they've had for you. But you're going to show up authentic and genuine and in a way that maintains your peace. Okay. Or you can see it as an opportunity to like nurture a relationship, you know, so reframe it. What is a different way for me to look at this? Instead of saying like, oh, I'm really lonely, you know, during this time, I don't have my family. It could be like, I, which was the case for me one year, like I have chosen to protect myself and protect my child. And that means that my chosen family this year is my friend's. And this is who I'm going to spend the holidays with. And I can feel comforted in knowing that I made the best choice for myself and for my children or for the future generations or whatever. So what is a different way to look at this that's going to be um, more healthy and also true? Okay, so we have like six minutes. I'm going to stop and ask Bree if there are any questions so far. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Blyde. That was awesome. We do have some questions and it's funny that you were just talking about the challenges with boundaries because one of our submitted questions is how do you set a boundary with people who are not used to you saying no? Yes. Yes. You do it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) You just do it anyway. You know, because like I said, like people get very uncomfortable when you try to set a boundary because they want you to continue to play the role in their life that they've prescribed for you, that they've scripted. But unfortunately, that can leave us feeling resentful and bridge a bigger gap in the relationship. We have to remember that boundaries are not only for ourselves to protect our peace, but it's also for the other person is to protect the relationship. That's great. It's so true. 
We have two more. The next question is, how do you recommend responding to a family member or family members who don't believe you or that you're sick with lupus because you look good, but may feel sick or need to take a break? Yes, yes. Show them Tony Braxton. Show them Selena Gomez. Show them, you know, the, 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 um, I don't want to say the nice thing, but the, um, there has been an awareness in the faces of lupus. You know, that's actually the, the name of my company faces of health because health can look very different. So right now I'm like on, and I got my little lipstick on, (laughs) you know, if I say so myself or whatever, but you don't see the times when I'm getting blood draws 12, you know, low capsules or whatever. And, and you don't see the times when I'm having to take three, four, five hour naps during the day, just to be able to show up for my three-year-olds, you know, so people really don't understand because we're not, you know, in a wheelchair, you know, until we, you know, if we progress to that point or we're not, you know, unless you can like see the rash and you have like uh, the discoid lupus, people don't see it. However, Sometimes just, you know, telling them what it is. No, actually, I'm feeling really fatigued. So giving some of that education is important. Other times just realizing that because of their own issues, because of their own wanting control and wanting to try to make sense of something that does not make sense, they're just going to impose their own opinions and their own values on them, on you. And you don't have to accept it. You can totally. just say like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you don't believe that I'm sick, but this is what it is. You shouldn't have to be in a hospital bed for them to be like, oh, oh, something is wrong. <laughs> I have a family member who still thinks that like nothing's wrong with me, that I'm just making it all up. And I'm like, yeah, if you only were in my body and experienced the constant pain, but I just realized that that's their own issues and I don't have to accept it. I don't have to um, let that tear down my energy or my focus on myself and my own health. That's such a great perspective. And I'm sorry, that's awful, but that's something so many patients experience in our community. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Last question I'll share here. Um, Someone submitted, are there any exercises or tools that you use to stay calm when triggered in a group setting at dinner or with family if we have to stay? Yes. That's a really good question. It's a great <laughs> opportunity for to promote the Faces of Health app. So, <laughs> so I did create a mental health skills training app and it's on the go. So it's like one to four minute videos of stress management techniques, things that you can do. I'm going to share with you right now one thing that's very easy to do and you can do it in a hidden way um, is called bilateral tapping. Bilateral means by two sides of your body, one side of the body, then the other. And you see this in like EMDR treatment. Prince Harry was on TV doing it recently like this. But when you do it fast, it activates the trauma. Don't do that. But when you do it slowly, it actually helps to calm down the nervous system. It activates something called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our body's parachuting down, uh, rest and digest, feed and breed. And you can do, you don't have to like, there's conflict at the table and you're like, oh God, you know, like (laughs) that's going to be pretty obvious and bring the attention on you, but you can actually do it with your feet inside your shoes. Interesting. This and then the other, this and then the other, and then take breaths. And what I'm doing actually is just breathing in through my nose and out through my nose. But as you're doing it, just make sure that your exhale is longer than your inhale. So whether it be an exhale that's out through the mouth, this is my feet still, or exhale through your nose, out through your nose, make sure it's longer because again, we're doing things to help calm down our nervous system. And in addition to these things, sometimes you just need to step away. They'll be like, oh, you got IBS or something. You keep going to the bathroom every 10 minutes. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go and take a breath, you know, and just do some tapping. Like I can, even though this is stressful, I can handle it. Even though these people getting on my nerves, it's almost over. Just do your tapping. You can learn the tapping skills in the Faces of Health app, you know, <laughs> but just like, 
you can handle it. You can handle it. You can handle it. And again, setting that boundary ahead of time. Oh, I'll just be able to stay, you know, for dinner, you know, or I got to head out. And you've already done the buffer zone, as I mentioned earlier of, you know, um, as soon as this is done or the next day or whatever, I already have my massage scheduled or I already have, you know, um, dinner planned with this friend who really like we fill each other, whatever the case might be, having those things pre-set aside so that you kind of anticipate that joy that's coming. I love that. These tools are so valuable. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Blyde. And for anyone watching this, if you are on um, social, we'll have the links to Dr. Blyde's app and other resources that she shared with us. Um, and you can also contact her on social media, her Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube are also linked in the caption. And um, we just really appreciate your time today, Dr. Blyde. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with the lupus community. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And if you guys are not yet connected to the Lupus LA support groups, that's going to help you make it through this holiday season. Yes. Baby, you are not the only one dealing with this. So join a support group, have your community, a community that fills you back up when you feel depleted. I love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Blyde. We'll see you again soon. Okay.